the middle seat, we're going to bring my our good mutual friend Carl Eschenbach up here. How about a round of applause for Carl? <laughs> Carl is uh, working for this up and comer called Sequoia. Um, <laughs> we're trying to help them get into our best deals. <laughs> Uh, Carl and I go back about 25 years, I think, uh, and we, we were working at a great company here in the Valley, and then he left to go for a startup called VMware, and it had about $30 million in revenue and 200 employees, and I took a breath, and next thing I know, he was running the company. It had $7 billion in revenue and 20,000 employees uh, co-running the company. Um, he's one of the best leadership strategy uh, executives and implementers you'll ever meet. And he did, he just kind of wrote the book on scaling uh, an enterprise software company. And uh, once he punched out of VMware, it been two years? Three. Three years now. Uh, the guys at Sequoia were smart enough to grab him uh, before we did. And uh, he's now on the boards of Palo Alto Networks, Workday, and he just had a whopper of an IPO in Zoom, uh, where you led the last growth round, uh, and uh, got I understand a pretty darn good multiple on uh, on that trade. So welcome, Carl. Uh, we wanted to bring, I guess, the perspective of uh, you know Carl's perspective. He's had some of the larger unicorn exits as an operator. Uh, and an investor alongside David. They've worked together on a multitude of deals over the years. Uh, so the three of us go back a little ways. Um, so Carl, I may, I may start with you, give David a chance to catch his breath. That was a lot of data in oh, yeah, a short no amount problem. of time. Do you want to just... How many... Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, the the pricing yeah. from the he, he promised this journal. yesterday. That's his Wall Street Probably. Journal, but yes. Is it okay? Forty five bucks a share, yeah. not too far off of what the speculation was. Um, anyhow, so Carl, um, the Zoom IPO. I mean, David gave some color commentary on that, but when you were first angling to get in that deal. What was your thinking about that company's exit trajectory? Did you know it was going public? Did you have a view to when? Or was it still going to potentially bifurcate to M&A? Did you think it was 18 months or to 10 years? What What was your thinking on that? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me. I'm afraid to say a damn word after that introduction. I can only go down. <laughs> so that's very kind to you. So, um you know, Sequoia had known Zoom and Eric for many years, for probably five or six years, um, and Eric was never really interested in taking any money because almost from the day he turned the company on, it was cash flow positive. So there was really no opportunity other than a small round that he did uh, maybe four or five years ago to take in any capital. Um, so therefore, as we spent a lot of time with Eric, he'd meet with everyone. Eric's a really really special man. He would meet with everyone, but you never got any data. Um, <laughs> so you had to come up with your own thesis around why this could be a special company. And a couple things led us to believe it could be special. And then I'll tell you the story of how we got in. Um, first of all, I mean, sure, everyone in here has now used Zoom, but every time we talk to anyone about the product or we used it, we always just say, it works. Like, Video conferencing and collaboration isn't supposed to work. It isn't supposed to be easy. So when you hit the button, it works. We're looking at each other. We're talking. And it just had high quality. Um, and we thought that that was very unique. And everyone was saying it's a boring market. There's no growth. There was another company in the market called Blue Jeans. It kind of was the rise of the tide. Um, and we just kept thinking that this, the product itself had enough differentiation that we'd continue to lean in. The other thing is we were really intrigued by their, their business model. So anyone in here can go and download Zoom and use it for 40 minutes for free. I mean, they have an excess of sometimes of hundreds of thousands of downloads a week, if you will, of people using this platform. So when you think about it from an investor perspective or you think about it from a go-to-market perspective, you have a natural top-of-the-funnel fulfillment happening because you have this virality taking place with all the free, free users. So we were very intrigued by it. And then we just started to call different customers, um, and we started to see them moving up market from this free model and people using it to the SMB, to the mid-market, and then we started to see quite frankly, some of the larger enterprises replacing Eric's old company, WebEx, on a pretty regular basis. So this all led to us saying, you know what, without seeing any numbers, we're going to offer Eric 
$100 million at a billion dollar valuation in October of 2016. Um, and he didn't need any money. Uh, but we thought the Sequoia brand, uh, the operating experience of the, some of the partners in the company um, could help him build a big scalable business. Um, come to find out their revenues were sub $100 million. So when we gave it to him, it was, you know, kind of the multiples of 10 to 20 next 12 months uh, revenue. And Eric said, yeah, he'll take it. And we were thrilled. Then we got the numbers and we almost peed our pants. We were so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then off to the races, we went um, Sequoia and then building a, a tremendous business to the metrics that you saw here that David spoke about. Top line growth, great gross margins, free cash flow positive. And during the road show, to David's point, everyone kept saying, this isn't like, this is not supposed to be like this, which is why it was so oversubscribed. And then obviously the excitement has happened since then. Um, but I always tell people, having been through it a multitude of times, be careful what you wish for when you go to the public markets. You better have a predictable business model that you know you can beat uh, and just continue to execute. Um, and that's one of the beauties of being a SaaS company because of the compounding uh, effect you get. Got it. So, Carl, a bunch of my LPs are in the room, and about half of them want to raise their hand and ask the question, so at what point do you start liquidating the shares and getting cash back to the fund? Actually, um, being three years in the venture community and having the blessing of being at Sequoia, um, I will tell you, Sequoia has a different philosophy. I mean, an exit isn't a distribution opportunity. Uh, it's just a period of time uh, where you get your biggest marketing event of the year, you prove to the enterprise you're real, and you have staying power. So if you look at you know our strategy, we talk about from idea to IPO and beyond, and that's our investment strategy. So you know if you look at Sequoia today, we're still holders in Square, we're still holders in Dropbox. Um, you know, we don't distribute just because there's an IPO and we come off a lockup in six months. And quite frankly, there's a $40 billion TAM that Eric has. And as you go public, it's not uncommon to see your TAM expand. Um, and we think that's the opportunity here. So there's no strategy in sight for us to distribute. Um, it's, it's Let's ride this wave because it's a really big opportunity. And he's just now getting into adjacent markets like the phone and cloud PBX and other things to expand where he's at today. So to answer your question, there is no strategy. We're going to hold on. Uh, we're big supporters of Eric and the team. And uh, we're going to ride this thing as long as we think that we should. That's great. And I like the strategy. Um, so, David, what, at, uh, talking about Eric and Zoom, at what point, I mean, you're generally getting way out in front of uh, offerings, but at what point did you meet uh, these guys and start building that relationship? And by the way, these guys did an amazing job. Um, <laughs> I remember we were doing the banker him, we meeting. We should let him go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we were doing the banker meeting, and we were having the bake-offs like these guys do, and they came in and and basically said, here's your S1. And we're like, what the hell do you mean? And like, these guys are world class at, which is why they have all the leads on these. So just to, you didn't ask right. me to plug, Thanks, but Carl, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, very good to partner with. So to be very specific. There's $100 I, dollar bills going back. Yeah, that's right. I can see it. To be very specific, that we, I, I, we met with a company when Carl introduced us to, to Eric, actually. So we actually owe the intro to, uh, to Carl here as well. So in general, yeah, it, it would be, we like to, you know, it, it just as a general statement, like, you know, 10 years ago, an IPO would be, company would just do its merry thing, going on its merry way, and then, you know, they hold a bake-off, and then after the bake-off, do an org meeting a, a month later, and then file the S1. And that's no longer really the case. Today, you know, we're meeting with companies typically almost like two years before I have two companies right now where I'm, I'm doing, you know, they want to go public a year and a half later. I'm doing kind of, you know, a meeting every two weeks to get them ready. And it's largely because post Jobs Act, you know, companies are now looking to go to the market and have lots of feedback before they actually go public. And so you have non deal roadshows, you have kind of the testing the waters process after you file the S1. And typically, uh, an IPO today versus 10 years ago, the big difference is, you know, 10 years ago, you're just exchanging business cards with these IPO investors. 60 one-on-ones, you're exchanging six, 60 rounds of business cards. You don't even know any of these guys. And here, today, you know, before you get there on the road, you, you should have already effectively met 
the top 25 at least twice, sometimes three times before you even get on the road. And so that takes a lot more work ahead of time. Yeah, it seems like the companies are staying private longer and these processes are, are getting longer. Is that fair to say? Yes, yes. I, I think just given the, you know, and this is maybe a question for Carl as well, this just given the, just the explosion in the diversity of supply of private capital, you know, we used to just kind of go to, you know, guys like Sequoia or Meritech and TCV, you know, back 12 years ago, 13 years ago for our big growth rounds. And today it's not just Sandhill Road players, it's the funds themselves, uh, institutions, hedge funds, sovereign wealth, you know, um, family offices. And so the pool of capital has expanded, which obviously gives these private companies a lot more options. But don't you think yeah. that creates better outcomes? You know, companies are, there's a complaint that the liquidity profile has a longer duration, but it, usually it's, you're getting more quality companies that are have reached scale or further along their growth trajectory, closer to profitability. So isn't that trend line of stretching out to IPOs probably a good thing because you get more quality companies listing? I, I think it's well said. Um, because there is enough capital in the private market, you can do everything you need to to clean up your company to prepare for the IPO. So when you go public, uh, you know, typically you've had a couple years of being uh, in the preparedness stage to do that because you can get funding. In fact, you see a lot of companies, David mentioned this, right before they even go public, raising hundreds of millions of dollars, right. literally a month before they're going out just to have, you know, a big piggy bank available to them. But yeah, there's, there's plenty of capital. A lot of people go through a lot of business model transformations in the private markets. Uh, the other thing is, one of the reasons in, in the older days you used to go public was to give your employees a liquidity event, and there's a large secondary market out there now where people can actually give their employees liquidity through a secondary offering in the private market, which probably didn't exist in such robustness as it did in the past. So there's, there's a fortitude of reasons to stay private, and quite frankly, the, the TAM in general and the global nature of business has rapidly expanded into Europe and obviously China. We have a large uh, presence in China. So I just think staying private a little bit longer um, to expand into some of these foreign markets to tap into the, the massive TAM they have is, is also another reason people stay private. Yeah, well, you know, a small thing is, is you know, as I showed in those charts, the other piece is they're raising these rounds right before they go public or maybe a year before they go public because of solving for growth versus profitability. And a lot of the times you have a company, you know, like perhaps like a Zoom that started with self-service model, but then now they want to move to the enterprise. Well, that's going to take a different motion. And so they want to actually have, you know, a little bit more cushion on the balance sheet to step on the gas, even if they're going to go public, you know, in six to nine months. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to build an enterprise sales force, it's not cheap. You're hiring Two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollar individual contributor sales reps, and to do that at scale, that adds up quickly, and that that wave of expense comes. So, having the capital to do that is uh, is something a lot of people do. So, Carl, when you think about, remind me, VMware went public when roughly uh, two thousand seven. So, wh maybe you could just contrast sort of the size and scale of that IPO towards, let's say, Zoom, and what would you say the big differences are from an IPO of that era like VMware and, and something like Zoom? Yeah, um, so, so I mean, knock on wood, I mean, VMware was rip-roaring as well. At the time, I think it was one of the bigger IPOs. Uh, you know, I think we raised a billion dollars in a market cap of maybe 10 billion, do you remember, roughly? It was 11? around 10, yeah. Um, and at the time in 2007, it was it was pretty uh, it was a pretty big IPO, um, hyper growth. Uh, we did have a very uh, fortuitous business model in the partnership with EMC. EMC bought us. It's interesting to be part of an acquisition and then go public and then be part of another acquisition with Michael Dell coming in. So you kind of go through these roller coasters with VMware. But at the public IPO offering, uh, we were in hyper growth mode. 
VMware was another company that had very good bottom line financials uh, because they started off with a product that was called Workstation before we even got into the data center. So I think that it was very similar, um, very rapid growth, if I recall. I'd have to go back, but I think we were growing probably well over 100%, and it was three to 600 million in revenue, so it was very similar trajectory. Um, it was just a different time. Uh, and I'd say that was much more of an enterprise sale. We were like selling to the CXOs um, in the data center. Uh, the beauty of VMware, as you all know today, was this very straightforward nature of the ROI and TCO model. It's like, let's take these 100 widgets and put them on these 10 widgets and we'll save you 90 um, you know, percent. So it was very straightforward. Um, but it was highly disruptive to the data center. So, you know, if you look at Eric, what he's doing, comparing contrast that to Zoom, he's disrupting a small segment or a vertical solution called collaboration. So it's easier to replace. And I think that's the virality you'll get faster with something like a, uh, a Zoom. Not saying that Zoom is gonna, you know, be the same, you know, trajectory as VMware over time, where it's now a $10 billion software company. But I think, you know, they're pretty similar at actually IPO now. I've never stopped to think about it till you ask the question. That's why that's why you're here. We want to challenge you a little bit with some new ones. I'm not um, coming back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, David, one of the questions that's on pretty much everybody's mind is, um, I guess, valuations in the main, sort of in the run-up to an IPO event or that stage, and even at the point of going public, I think you know Zoom did great in terms of when you got in. What was that? I guess that was two, well, almost two and a, a half years. A little over two years. A little ago. over two years. Um, we've obviously had you know a couple. Of your chart showed a couple in the red that are you know trading below the the IPO price. So people start asking the question: Well, geez, are the the growth equity pre IPO rounds are those just too frothy where it's too hard to make money? What's what's your view on the the relative pricing of these later stage rounds? It's a loaded question, but yeah, it's it's certainly very very. Um, it's it's it, it 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 basically mirrors basically what I showed you on the on the public market side. You know, I would say maybe a, a year and a half ago we start. We, you know, the the market had not totally broke to the upside, and so we started to see companies that are looking for you know, top ticking the, on a valuation side, but then they would introduce structure uh, into these rounds to just try to get the headline number to what they want. And so I think it was still a little more investor friendly back then, largely because I think if you remember, we had this whole unicorn class back in 2013, 2000, you know, even, even before that, which raised big rounds at massive valuations and then actually disappointed, um, you know, five years later. And so I think investors were still kind of stung by that. And so we had a little bit of still investor-friendly terms maybe about a year and a half ago. I think that's kind of all gone away, um, where big, you know, big, big private companies are raising rounds at, you know, call it you know, thir 13, 14, 15 times ARR, sometimes 20 times ARR uh, to peg to IPO valuations. So yes, it's high. Um, in terms of kind of where we're going in the market, you know, we still see pretty strong fundamentals, you know, macro economy, uh, global economies seem to be kind of all kind of in sync from a global growth, growth perspective. The digital transformation piece and kind of IT spend, we see kind of, we saw 5% IT spend last year, 4.8% spend this year, which is still pretty strong if you've lived through IT cycles over the last 20 years. And then the digital initiatives just they are must-have, not a nice-to-have. And then the last six quarters and tech earnings have been pretty strong. So we don't really see this stopping anytime soon. Yeah, and it looks like it still has some headroom despite what people think. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I'm on the board of another company called UiPath that we just announced a $600 million uh, raise last week at a $7 billion valuation in the private market. Um, and, you know, this, this company's growing rapidly, but, you know, we'll probably have to grow into that market, uh, you know, valuation as well. But that's the type of things you're seeing in the private sector now where people are willing to pay forward to get that multiple. Um, and when they compare and contrast it, what they do is they look at all the data that David showed on the public market side and say, hey, where does this, where does this fit into the public market, right? But even though we're private, they look at the same valuations when, you get, in this case, we got a bunch of crossover investors, the T-Rose, the Dragoneers, the Kotrus who invest, 
because they're the type of people we want in this round so that when we go public, they're there for the public IPO and they'll buy more. Yep. So it's, it's high valuations even in the pr uh, private market today. And David, you, sh you contrasted M&A versus IPO. Can you give us just a, a loose quantitative view for, for any exits north of, let's say, a billion? What's the ratio between M&A versus public listings? Do you have a sense for that offhand, even ballpark? Uh, M&A exits north of a billion versus IPOs. North of a billion. In Yeah, IPOs north of a billion dollar in size. I would say, yeah, like, you know, typically tech IPOs, again, I said 30 to 40 in any given year. And M&A deals uh, over a billion. Yeah, I would probably say in the, you know, I would, you know, of the, of the, of the really interesting ones, I would probably say, in some years, it's been kind of two to one IPO to M and A, mm. and um, more recently, uh, in the last three years, it's been kind of one to one. Interesting. Yeah. And below a billion, it might. Oh yeah. Invert. Below below a billion, it inverts absolutely. Yeah. yeah. To yeah. to the to the M and A side. And yeah. that's typically because other than the six or eight outliers you showed that were the six to eight billion dollar acquisitions. Right. The corporate uh, development folks, you know, from big tech and big brands and even the large cap financial sponsors, they're generally looking for stuff that's in that, you know, 100 million to 500 Less million. Less than 500 million. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But, but because of that imperfect storm thesis, you know, the ratios, it's going to be tough to get to the one to one here in, in calendar 19. I think, I think the IPO volume is going to outpace M&A. Unless we have a blip in the market, and then you know seller valuations actually get more reasonable. And do you, where do you think when it's all said and done this year will compare with the last twenty years in terms of productive tech IPOs? It's again as as we we got off to a slow start, so we can only do so many uh, across all of Wall Street. So I think I'm not sure we're going to get to thirty by the maybe thirty by the end of this year. I think we'll be kind of close to that. So it's going to be on a on a unit volume basis a, a a slower year, but I think it's going to be a massive setup if the market continues into into twenty twenty. Great, um, I think some of you probably have some questions. As you know, we've got a few people with runner mics out there, Mr. Hayden. So David, I want to come to your Christmas party for the bonus this year, <laughs> Carl. <laughs> <Jesus>. yeah. <laughs> Carl, so it's, it's, it's at the Tamarind in Palo Alto, it's, it's, so that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. I'm putting it on the calendar, thank you. Uh, Carl, congratulations to your uh, career and kind of this chapter of it. So a couple questions. One is, you know, look, the, the, the sequoias of the world have always been so ingrained and you've got so many tentacles, you get to see deal flow way before everybody else. But I wonder as more and more competition comes in for those dollars, are you seeing the deal flow get tougher? Um, and then next is, what is the next Zoom that's in your portfolio right now? If you can share that. <laughs> uh, please look through it and let me know. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that some companies we're excited about. As far as the competitive environment, listen, there's more capital than ever. And admittedly, three years in this business and 29 in an operating role, I'm learning it. And I would say even in the last three years that I've been at Sequoia, uh, there's no doubt the competitive environment has changed with the amount of capital we have. Uh, that being said, you know, the thing I love about Sequoia, it's performance, it is a performance driven <laughs> culture. It's kind of quiet. We're not out there. We're not promotional. Uh, we just focus on executing and finding the best companies in the world. And to do that, we also have to innovate. So we do things like uh, leveraging data science. We have a big data science practice. Uh, we have something called a scouts program where we give, you know, a whole bunch of people that are in our network over the last 45 years money to go invest on our behalf. Don't need our approval to get in early to companies uh, based, in, based on their network. Um, we have programs. We have founder-to-founder -founder programs where there's a kinship with entrepreneurs where they love to be together with one another. Uh, yeah, hopefully the Sequoia is providing massive amounts of value, but there's a lot of value in getting them together on a regular basis. We have different programs like that. So, um, And then also, I would say, you know, 
while the competition's getting tougher, uh, I think we're getting tougher and we're getting more global in nature. Uh, many, many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, we went international. Uh, we have a large presence now in India and Southeast Asia, and we also are doing pretty damn well in China with Neil Chen being one of the top producers of the venture capital world over there. So we get to leverage a global pr footprint. Um, and then I just think we're uh, always looking to expand our partner uh, you know, community inside the building. Uh, you know, four of our last six hires have been diverse candidates. So we have, uh, you know, access to a different pool of talent now because of that. Um, so I just think uh, we don't rest on our past success. I'll tell you that as a Koi. It's every day. What are we doing different? Um, and our objective is not always to be everyone's best friend, but we're going to be their best business partner to help them go from idea to IPO and beyond. As far as companies that are up and coming, listen, there's a bunch of them, um, you know, I'd probably be biased and, and, you know, the ones I'm involved in, I'm pretty excited about. I'll do it that way because there's a whole slew of them. We're in Airbnb, we're in Dropbox, we're in, you know, uh, Instacart, we're in DoorDash, we're, you name it, uh, we're in a whole bunch of great companies. On the enterprise side, where I personally, you know, spend a lot of my time in the boards I'm on, really excited about Snowflake. I think Snowflake is creating an avalanche, if you will. Um, and what they're doing in the data warehouse space and moving it to the cloud, I think that's a really exciting company. I think UiPath is another one. Uh, we've invested in autonomous vehicle and self-driving car companies like Aurora, where I think they have the dream team of uh, self-driving vehicles. Um, we have Confluent, which is an open source technology uh, called Kafka that's been you know, brought into the company called Confluent that's doing extremely well. I can go on and on. I mean, uh, we, we love all of our children, if you will. Um, and we feel like all of them have the opportunity to do something yeah. quite special. Confluence, Snowflake, and UiPath and Zoom. Whose Christmas party do you actually really want to go to here? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Who else uh, has a question? Yep. Todd. Quick question. So you, you were with... Uh, VMware, when Dell bought EMC, uh, I think 2015 or 16 or something like that for 65 billion, um, and it's since reversed, and it was the tracking stock, and it's been in the press lately. Do you think there's going to be more of that type of activity in your community and in your world, in the tech world in, in general, these larger companies like Dell and uh, guys like Icon who are uh, – making themselves more and more involved, do you think they'll be uh, pressing the envelope, I guess, per se, to separate these really, really large businesses? I don't know. David probably can, he probably sees yeah. a little bit more than I at this mm -hmm. point. I mean, I think the big will continue to get bigger. There is a consolidation of power at the top of the stack of the big tech companies. Uh, they're flush with cash. And they have market valuations to give them the capital firepower, both in cash and stock, to do creative things. So will it continue? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing it will, but David might know a little better than I what the M&A environment looks like. That one was a really interesting one, getting EMC. With that, you get VMware, and then you buy back the tracking stock. It was, it's a very uh, complex operating model. I'll tell you, it's, it's really interesting to, to watch that one. Because he's Michael Dell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I worked on the sub IPO of SecureWorks out of Dell, and you know, it was successful because it was kind of a win-win. Given you know, SecureWorks was more services. Dell sold products and and a little bit of software, so they did very different things. But at the same time, Michael Dell would pick up the phone and just break into any CIO on the behalf of SecureWorks, and then they built a field sales force as well. And so I think that model is absolutely a very beneficial one. And, you know, I, I literally have, you know, two current, two current conversations around, you know, doing that for other situations, large cap companies, largely because they want to buy, maybe take it public later, but you know, they, they want to preserve the culture and team of something that's very circumscribed. And you see so many situations where these big companies just like basically buy these companies and just kill them uh, from a cultural mismatch perspective. So I think you're going to see more of that as well.
Yeah, I mean, Dell also did it with uh, Pivotal, a uh, very similar thing. They ran the VMware playbook, kept it an independent company, and spun it out to be public while maintaining 80-plus percent ownership. I'm, I'm sure it's that because that's how you can do consolidated reporting, too. Other questions? Raghu. With tech, you know, becoming so ubiquitous, uh, I mean, both for Carl and David, uh, especially you know, in fintech, digital health, retail, you know, we had panels across the board today. How do you see, you know, this convergence of, you know, established verticals with tech, how that will impact M&A and uh, IPOs? It's, yeah, I mean, it's a great tee up to one of the big trends that we've seen in M&A. You know, seven, eight years ago, you got an so enterprise software company and you want to run an auction. You just basically call Oracle, Cisco, IBM, SAP, Salesforce, and that's pretty much it. It was a pretty easy job. And maybe kind of six to 12 of your usual suspects. And today, you know, you know, I would say, 40 to 40% 40 of our M&A deals in software over the last two years have involved at least one non-traditional buyer. So industrial company, someone from the, um, someone, someone an international buyer. Uh, and then I think, I think the number is like 60% uh, involve over two types of uh, a non-traditional buyer asset classes as well. So Given the convergence themes that you just mentioned, you know, like for example, like Morgan Stanley, we're actually putting, we just put together a whole series, uh, merging kind of investors and companies, call our Envision series, to do just that, to bring together digital plus some other industry. We did the one on healthcare in New York a month ago, and we're doing one um, in in about a month on the industrial IoT side, kind of taking kind of the industrial guys and talking about IoT and how, how that affects um, software companies. So that, that is a, one of the key drivers of, I think, M&A over the next couple of years. Yeah, the, the other thing, I, I mean, David, I've seen their chart. They have a chart that talks about, you know, the past 10 years of, of big acquisitions and who the buyer was and now who it's been over the most recent uh, past few years, and it's amazing to see the shift of the GEs of the world and other bigger, you know, multinationals making these acquisitions. The other thing you mentioned is we are seeing uh, a pretty big disruption in fintech. Um, we uh, we recently uh, invested and in had a couple rounds in Robinhood, which is a really interesting company, very very disruptive to the traditional fintech world. You're seeing that happen in areas like real estate. You're seeing it happen in healthcare. Um, you're seeing it happen in, you know, life insurance. There's all of these disruptions happening in these these markets that have been rather stagnant uh, for many, many years, and it's all being driven by tech uh, to disrupt those more stale stale markets. And those those companies at times are in a really tough place. It's truly the innovator's dilemma because a lot of these are public, and you can't make the investment to pivot because you have a shareholder base that you got to make sure you're appeasing. Uh, with your traditional business model. So that's why the world of startups and the venture community exists to go disrupt the market that hasn't been disrupted. Yeah. Uh, other questions? So just, um, are direct listings becoming more common and does it matter? Great question. So we absolutely had uh, phenomenal success with Spotify recently. And I think there are others in the, in the hopper um, obviously, Spotify was consumer. I think there are others in the hopper from an enterprise perspective. I think companies that are looking at direct listings are looking at it for a number of reasons. You know, one would be they don't need any capital. So by by virtue of like a direct listing versus an IPO, you're not actually raising or issuing any primary cap primary capital. So you got to check that box. Uh, number two would be you have to have a philosophy of being more open. You know, versus kind of a lot of the companies that went public a decade ago, they would kind of give very little metrics versus today. If you do a direct listing, because you're not actually interacting with any research analysts, there's no underwriting. You're not actually interacting with any equity research analysts to kind of give them a sense for where your model is going to be. So then when you go public for a traditional IPO, you can be confident that when you report a quarter, the analysts have your back because you've basically given them a generally where to hit 
so you can basically beat the consensus. Well, how do you do that in a direct listing if you're actually not talking to any research analysts? And so you have to be a little more transparent from a guidance perspective. And so some companies actually just don't like that. So you have to be have you have to have a guidance friendly philosophy within your company. Um, and then third, you know, I think you just have to have a certain profile. You know, probably all the companies that Carl just mentioned would would meet that. But you have to be reasonably. Um, you, you have to. There tends to be some visibility um, around it. Um, you know, obviously that's why we started with Spotify. Uh, not not hard to understand what they do. And then going down the spectrum, it just needs to be a company that people really, really love and care about so that actually research analysts, for example, will want to cover you even if you don't really have an underwriting. And, and then I think fourth would be, you know, kind of consistent with some of the private capital discussions that Brian teed up would be it is actually helpful um, between the time you're private to the direct listing if you actually have a little bit of liquidity ahead of the direct listing because you know you're basically trying to determine on the direct listing kind of what is that price going to be and so the secondary market that Carl mentioned is important because it's useful to actually have some trades so you actually can get a nice a little bit of a barometer before the actual listing event itself so those, those would be four things great question yeah, and on that point about uh, the secondaries, if you guys were here for the finance panel, Nico Sand, who's the CEO of Zambato, one of Sway's portfolio companies, has become probably one of the more productive digital marketplaces for secondaries. It's fun to go on there and look at the indicative pricing, because you can put puts and calls, and you've got issuers uh, uh, you know, of, of all kinds of securities that uh, some of have been mentioned here today. Probably time for one or two more questions. Anybody on this yeah. side of the room? We've got one here. Okay, great. Hey, guys. Um, I'm uh, I'm Yash Patel, partner with Telstra Ventures. Uh, Carl, congratulations again on Zoom. It's, uh, it's, it's Let me be great. clear. I've, they, they deserve all the credit. No, absolutely. Eric, be, Eric I'm a just a and, uh, very fortunate investor and board member, and I'm thankful. <laughs> yeah, no, great. And, and you know, one of the questions I had was around sort of business models you're sort of seeing with these enterprise software companies. So Zoom, Slack kind of growing up more organically from the bottoms up versus, um, you know, account-based selling that Salesforce and Oracle kind of perfected historically. I spend my time, you know, both on consumer and enterprise, and it's kind of interesting to see some of my enterprise companies adopting consumer, uh, you know, kind of um, tactics there. And so I'm kind of curious how you guys look at that whether it's right for certain companies and not right for other companies, um, you know, and then maybe from a public market perspective, David, how investors kind of look at that sure. as well. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, let me just start by by saying I think when people think about you know uh, startup companies or even in the growth stage companies, everyone's always focused on innovation, and they should be. But I actually think you got to break down innovation into three different areas. Number one, there's organic innovation where you're inter internally innovating uh, and bringing new products, goods, or services to market, and really leveraging your engineering organization. The second type of innovation is around inorganic innovation where you see a market opportunity, and in most startups and young companies, and VMware was like this. I remember. It well, if you find something that you want to go after, the engineering organization said, we can do that, but there's a time to market race, so we'd inorganically innovate and make acquisitions. And I would say, now I'm biased, spending 30 years in go-to-market marketing and business, um, I think the third area, innovation, trumps the first two, and I've seen it happen many a times, it's go-to-market innovation. And I think between pricing, packaging, how you sell, what your business model is, how you segment the market can be wildly, wildly powerful. And I'm leading to your, your answer or your question now is, you know, although I did big enterprise deals for many, most of my career, I would tell you most of the business I was associated with started with a bottoms up adoption. VMware, we started with $3,000 a license for the first two or three years. And, and that's, we would just seed the market and then you grow from there. So our CAC was low, but our lifetime value was high because we had a great cohort expansion. Um, so I think the bottoms up business model that have the opportunity to go and sell the big enterprise agreements is one that I would prefer especially as you start to think about getting into the public markets. And because in the public markets, what you don't want to have is lumpiness. You want predictability. And if you have a transactional business where you can make your numbers and layer on top the big deals, 
That's the holy grail of selling. Bottoms up, tops down, meet in the middle to drive growth. That's how I think about it. But it's a great question, and people forget about the innovation on go-to-market. All right. Thank you, Carl. I'm going to call it there for the questions. <laughs>